Hi, this is Ken Johnson for another episode of SetCast. This tutorial is part one of a two-part tutorial on broken authentication and session management, or OWASP's Top 10 2013 A2 category. We've split this topic into two videos because the topic is broad and requires thorough explanations. Again, this tutorial will only cover session-related weaknesses. We'll discuss client versus server cookies, cookie flags, what do they mean and how do we set them, and finally, session fixation. We demonstrate both prevention as well as the vulnerability by attacking the weakness. Let's get started. Client and server cookie terminology relates to the location of storage. What is being stored, you ask? Primarily information that allows the application to identify which user in the database the session belongs to. When we say client side, this means that the information is stored within the cookie itself. Because browsers retain cookies for specified periods of time, this means the browser is storing the cookie which is storing user profile information. This will become clear when we decode and deserialize a client side cookie. Server side means that while a cookie is issued to a user, the cookie is used to query the database in order to find information that will specify who the owner of the cookie is. Basically, the session is a key used to look up a value. Again, this will become clear as you follow along. The following is our Rails application session store file. This configuration file is used to tell the application where to store our cookies, what they should be named, and which security flags should be applied. By default, Rails will issue the HTTP only flag on all cookies that it provides to users. No further configuration is required to have this protection. If you are unfamiliar with the HTTP only flag, don't worry, we will be discussing it further in the next section. Here you see that our application is configured to use the cookie store as its session store mechanism. This is the default setting with Rails applications. Personally, I prefer server side cookies from a security perspective. For one, a server side cookie can truly expire, whereas a client side cookie is just removed from the browser. We'll discuss this more in a bit. Using the default cookie store setting, we'll authenticate into the application and review our cookie. We'll copy and paste our cookie into our Rails console so that we can do some decoding and deserialization of the cookie. We use the split method because there are two parts to these cookies, and they are separated by two hyphens. The first part contains data about the user and is serialized and encoded. In Rails 4, these cookies can be encrypted as well. The second part is an integrity hash. So we need to get rid of the URL encoding. We'll use CGI on escape. And finally, we need to marshal deserialize and base64 decode the data. What you can see is a hash of data containing a user ID value. When you place a variable such as user ID into the session object, and when you're using client side cookies, this is where it shows up and where it is stored. The following is code from the Active Support Ruby gem. We are looking at the message verifier class. As you can see, the verify method is called and it splits the cookie into two parts with the two hyphens being the delineating string. It then performs a comparison of the second part of the cookie, which is a digest or integrity hash portion of said cookie along with the return value of generate digest, which takes the first part of the cookie, the data, as input. As you can see, a hash is generated leveraging the application secret token and the data provided in the cookie. If they don't match up, the cookie is dropped. If they do match up, the serializer of choice, by default it's Marshall, is used to deserialize the base64 value and is a usable cookie via the session object within controllers. I personally feel it is incredibly important to really understand how this works. Going back to my original suggestion of using server-side cookies, let's raise a few points here. Firstly, the biggest concern here is that these cookies by default won't expire unless a new secret token is used or a random GUID is placed in the session every time a user authenticates and logs out. The reason is that active support is simply performing a hashing routine and comparing string data. It isn't checking for expiration. There may be browser restrictions that clear the cookie in a user's browser, but it really never goes away once generated and captured. 
Secondly, by default in Rails 3 and 2 applications, Marshall is used as the default serialization, meaning arbitrary objects are loaded into the application's memory. Metasploit, a popular pen testing framework, has a module which leverages remote code execution in Marshall serialization to provide attackers with remote access. All the attacker needs is the application's secret token, so please keep that out of your source code. Lastly, if you place anything remotely sensitive into these cookies via non-encrypted cookies, which really isn't an option out of the box with Rails 2 and 3, they are susceptible to compromise. To recap, now that you understand the difference between client and server-side cookies at a granular level, it should be obvious why server-side cookies are preferred by security folks. The computational overhead of a database query, which must take place in order to identify a user by server-side cookies, is not detrimental enough to go a less secure route and use client-side cookies. In order to switch to server-side cookies, we'll need to revisit our session store file and comment out line 3. Next, we will uncomment line 8, which uses active record store versus the cookie store, and add a key of Rails Goat session for standard naming convention purposes. Following the instructions provided in this file, we will generate a session migration, which will add a sessions table to our database, and then run rake db migrate to run the migration file. And I'll restart the Rails application. Finally, we log out. After having restarted the application and making those configuration changes, we will authenticate back into the application and review our session cookie. As you can see, the session cookie value structure looks very different from the old client side cookies. We will still leverage what appears to be a unique value, but it contains no data. Using a tool called SQLite Database Browser, we can review our database, and here we see our session stored within the sessions table. The data column contains just that, the martial and encoded data which would normally, by default, be placed into the cookie. So to summarize, we've covered why client-side cookies are not preferred and why server-side cookies are, as well as how to change this setting. We briefly mentioned the HTTP-only flag in the previous section. Once again, by default, this flag is set on cookies issued by Rails applications unless purposefully configured to behave otherwise. HTTP-only is basically a security statement that says JavaScript can't touch the cookie. Keep in mind, this does not affect normal application behavior such as AJAX requests, so there is really no good reason not to use this flag. HTTP only severely impacts the success of certain types of XSS or cross-site scripting attack payloads. To be clear, this does not prevent nor protect your application from XSS, far from it in fact, but it can help prevent the effectiveness of certain types of XSS payloads which require access to the document.cookie object via JavaScript in order to be successful. I'll demonstrate the vulnerable configuration as well as show what the finding looks like in Brakeman, a popular open source static analysis tool for Ruby on Rails. First, we will want to see what this cookie flag looks like when returned from the server. We'll authenticate into the application and review the response from the application in our intercepting proxy. As you can see, a set cookie header is sent to our browser with an HTTP only flag. If someone were to disable this, which to reiterate is an insecure setting, this is what it would look like. They would append an HTTP only key with a value of false. I encourage you to audit your applications for mistakes like this. We'll restart the Rails app, authenticate once again, and review the response. Note that the cookie is missing the HTTP only flag or directive and thus is configured insecurely. Finally, the following is a report generated by Brakeman. You can see that a warning regarding the session setting has been provided. When we review the code, it shows the vulnerable line of code. So we've learned not to disable HTTP only protections as well as ensure that you audit existing applications for this weakness.
A link to the Breakman tool has been provided under the references section of this tutorial. If you are unfamiliar with the secure flag, this prevents the cookie from being transported over non-SSL channels. The cookie cannot be set by the application nor retrieved from a user's browser if HTTPS is not in use. There are two primary ways to set this flag. Firstly, you can do this via the session store configuration file. To do so, we'll add secure and true to our configuration file and restart the application. Next, we will authenticate to the application using a non-SSL or regular HTTP connection. Note that in the response, we are redirected to the dashboard, indicating a successful authentication. However, we are not provided with a cookie. This is because the application will not allow issuing a secure cookie over an unencrypted connection. The second, most common place you can configure the secure flag is within your environment files. In our production config file on line 31, we'll uncomment the force SSL option. This not only sets the secure flag on our cookie, but also enables additional SSL specific protections on our site. Session fixation is a vulnerability that is difficult to explain, so instead we will show you how the attack works. The black colored browser is our attacker machine. We've identified XSS or cross-site scripting, and as a demonstration of running our JavaScript on the site, we've created an alert box with the number one in it. In addition to XSS, this application does not have HTTP only on its cookies. So we have the ability to not only read the document.cookie attribute, but write to it as well. We just need our JavaScript to run on the site. Thankfully, that's what an XSS attack is all about. Now, as an attacker, we don't have access to the application. However, when visiting the site, we are still issued a session value. It just isn't associated with any user of the site yet. So at this point, this session is pretty much useless as far as accessing the application with it. To make this work, we need someone else, a valid user of the site, to use this cookie when they log in. That way, the application will associate this session with another user in their database. So this means we need to leverage XSS, a lack of the HTTP-only flag on cookies, which protects them from read-write access by JavaScript, and email someone a link that will execute our XSS. Once that person logs in, our session should be usable in terms of accessing the application since that user will be associated with the session. Now here's the root cause of the issue beyond the vulnerabilities I've identified. During authentication, a call to reset session should be made. This will rotate the pre-authentication session out with a new post-authentication session. This way, the user data is associated with a session value that could have only been known and given to the person who authenticated. So let's see this attack in action. We've retrieved our session and put in our JavaScript code, which writes to the document.cookie object and sets a cookie value. Normally, we'd email this link to our victim, but in this case, we are just going to simply paste the URL and code into the victim's browser for brevity as well as demonstration purposes, instead of having them click on this link from an email. So we've requested this URL as the victim. Let's take a look at our cookie to see if it was set to the same one as the attacker's unauthenticated session cookie. And it is. XSS and a lack of HTTP only on the session cookie made this part possible. Next, we need the victim to log in. Now that they have authenticated in, their user profile data should be associated with the attacker's cookie. Now, in the attacker's browser, we are going to hit refresh and hopefully, instead of seeing the login page, we should be redirected to the dashboard and logged in as the victim's account. And it worked. So besides fixing the XSS vulnerability and the lack of an HTTP only flag on our cookies, another aspect that is important is to ensure we reset a user session during login.
This is a must as it has no negative impact and much is gained from a security perspective. Prior to setting any variables on the user session, call the method reset session. This way a new session is issued prior to placing things like a user ID or other user specific information within that session. We'll add a comment on line 18 and invoke the reset session method. And with that, we fix the session fixation problem. Obviously, we'd still need to take care of those other vulnerabilities, but for now, we fixed at least one significant session weakness. To recap, use reset session to prevent session fixation both at login and logout. Ensure that the appropriate cookie flags are set, such as secure and HTTP only, and we'd have explained the benefits of server-side cookies over client-side cookies. I'm Ken Johnson. This has been another episode of SecCast. Thanks for watching.